All right, so we'll start. Uh, good morning to everyone who is connected. Today is the ninth lecture uh, in, um, of Introduction to Artificial Intelligence. And the topic of today's lecture will be about reinforcement learning. So I have to be honest, this is the first time I'm giving this lecture. Uh, it's, it, it was not part of the course uh, last year. So if you feel that things are um, maybe vague or you don't understand, also feel free to, to, to ask questions directly in the chat so that I can uh, re-explain if needed. So basically the topic of today's lecture will be about how to make decisions under uncertainty, which is similar to what we've talked about last week when we uh, uh, studied Markov decision processes. But there will be a fundamental difference, which is that we don't know anything about the environment. So we'll have to learn about the environment while making decisions. And so that problem is often known as reinforcement learning, or an approach rather to, to solve this problem is reinforcement learning. So we'll first describe what re reinforcement learning is, um, just to motivate and, and define the problem. And then we'll uh, build a solution in two steps. First, we'll uh, talk about passive reinforcement learning, which will be about how to evaluate the goodness of a policy, which is fixed when the environment is unknown. And then once we we'll have achieved that, uh, we'll move on to active reinforcement learning in which the policy will not be fixed anymore. Uh, and we'll try both to evaluate a policy, but also to improve it uh, towards an optimal policy. We'll see two families of methods or two ways to approach this problem. One is called the mo model-based approach, and the other one is called the model-free approach. So to give you an overview of where we are and uh, what we'll see today, uh, we can div di basically divide um, the problem of decision making uh, with Markov decision processes uh, in two parts. The first part, or the first, uh, the, the, the first instance of the problem, I would say, is uh, what you would do when you know the Markov decision process, right? Which is the content of the previous lecture, lecture eight. And when you know the, con the, the Markov decision process, meaning you know the, the set of states, the set of actions, and very importantly, you know the transition model and the reward function, uh, then this basically boils down to a planning problem. Um, and we've seen uh, last week uh, algorithms to uh, compute uh, the, the utilities of the states uh, with uh, uh, the value iteration algorithm. Uh, and we have also seen how to, uh, an alternative which is called policy iteration uh, to directly derive uh, the optimal policy from which you could also derive then the uh, utility of the states. We have also seen algorithm to just evaluate a policy uh, which we'll reuse today. So this is quite easy uh, when you know the MDP. Unfortunately, in practice, you will not know usually too much about the environment, and so you will not know in particular the transition model and the reward function. But you will be able to, of course, to uh, interact uh, with the environment. And so we'll see two, 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 two approaches to solve this problem uh, when uh, the MDP is unknown, and the first approach will be this model-based approach. And basically what we'll uh, do there is that we'll try first to uh, learn an approximation of the transition model and of the reward function. And once we'll be equipped with this approximate transition model and reward functions, then that will, re will, will have reduced back to a known MDP for which uh, we can uh, run uh, planning algorithms like value of policy iteration. And then the second case is when you don't want to explicitly model uh, this um, transition or reward functions, but directly want to learn the utility of the states or directly want to uh, evaluate the policy. And so we'll see that this is 
this, this can actually be achieved. And so we'll see uh, an algorithm known as Q-learning to, to solve this problem. But we'll not directly uh, uh, present this solution. We'll, we'll, we'll build it up, we'll, we'll, we'll build the solution uh, uh, in two steps. First, uh, and this is what I call passive reinforcement learning, will be about uh, the problem of evaluating a fixed policy under an unknown MDP. Uh, and we'll see how to do that either uh, in a model-based or in a model-free fashion. And once we've done that, in the second part of today's lecture, we'll talk about active reinforcement learning, which will be about computing, uh, for example, the utility of the states, meaning the utility of the states when you follow an optimal policy. Um, and so we'll see how to do that, how to derive these values, and then from it, of course, how to derive the optimal policy. Right, so that's for the overview, that's the plan for today. But before we, we go into, into reinforcement learning, I, I think it's quite important to just do a quick recap on Markov decision processes, what we've seen last week, because we'll build uh, upon this uh, today uh, quite, quite heavily. Okay, so we define a Markov decision process, an MDP, as a tuple, S-A-P-R, such that S, is a set of states, uh, and the states we denote them by this lowercase s. Um, a is a set of actions, then P is a stationary transition model, uh, which defines the conditional uh, probability of reaching state s prime, uh, given that you perform action A from state s, right? Uh, and so we assume that this transition model is known in an, in an MDP. Then R is a reward function that maps immediate and finite reward values uh, that you obtain when you uh, reach uh, a state S. We also talked about uh, discount factors last week, and uh, 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 which define basically how you should uh, uh, evaluate uh, the goodness of sequence of rewards. And uh, usually this value, uh, when the, the, uh, the length of the episode can be infinite, uh, will be set to a value which is uh, strictly positive, uh, but strictly smaller than one. Uh, when the sequence of actions is always finite, you can uh, then in this case set gamma, the discount factor to one if, if you want to. And so the, the setup, if you remember, is the following. So we have a, a, an agent uh, uh, for which we would like to, to, to make decisions. And so initially the agent is, some, is in some state S, which is known to the agent. And then this agent has to uh, take actions uh, in some environment. And so at every time step, the agent will have to decide what is the next action that it should perform. And this action is denoted by this lowercase a. And then the result of this action will be uh, that th then the agent will reach a next state, which will be sampled from the transition model. So it will reach a, a state S prime sampled from our transition model, defining the conditional probability uh, S prime given S and A. And then this resulting state will be informed to the agent. So the agent uh, will know that it has reached uh, the state S prime. And also, we, will as we assume in this case that the agent know uh, the reward function, therefore it also know uh, the reward R prime that it collects uh, in uh, that corresponding state. So, one thing, one technical uh, point that I would like to, to stress today is that uh, although uh, MDPs generalize to continuous state action spaces, We'll assume today uh, in this lecture that both the state of the, 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 the both uh, the, the the state space and the action space are discrete and finite. Okay, which will just make our life uh, much simpler. But of course, uh, algorithm that we we'll, that we'll see today uh, can be adapted uh, to continuous uh, state and action spaces. But it's not that easy. Also. The formalism that we use uh, in this course to define MDPs is actually not unique. Um, so there, there are several other ways you could define MDPs. 
and a quite well-established and equiv equivalent variant is instead to define the reward function with respect to a transition, which is a triple S, A and S prime. And therefore, we would define the reward function not only in terms of a single state S, but in terms of this transition. So this is strictly equivalent, uh, but in terms of the formalism and then all the associated equations, uh, you will need to reformulate the algorithms uh, that we've seen last week. Um, and this is something you will uh, see uh, during uh, the exercise session on MDPs. All right. Then from this MDP, we, the, the, we, we talked about an important equation, uh, which is the Bellman equation, which basically states that the utility of a state is the immediate reward for that state, so Rs, plus the expected discounted utility of the next state. So the expected, which is taken by the, taking this average over the, all the possible next states um, of the utility of the next state, so V of S prime, assuming that the agent chooses the optimal action, right? So assuming that the agent chooses the optimal action, which is given by the action which maximizes uh, precisely this expected uh, utility for the next state. And so basically from this, we saw that to, to be optimal, uh, what you had to do is first to take uh, uh, the correct action, the optimal action, and then from there on to keep being optimal. And we saw that, uh, which is what is uh, basically this uh, uh, equation is recursive, recursively saying, it says that First, you should take the optimal action to reach the next uh, state, so the one for which the expected utility is, ma is maximum. And then if you remember, uh, or, or, or already from this equation, V is itself V of the S prime is itself defined recursively from this equation. And so therefore, we would have to keep being optimal when we want to evaluate uh, this V value. What we also uh, have seen is that uh, this equation, the Bellman equation, results in a system of n equations where n is the number of states in your MDP. But unfortunately, this, these equations are nonlinear because of this max operator that you see there. Uh, but still, we've seen that uh, there are algorithms that you can use to solve, uh, for, uh, to solve this, this system of equations, which means concretely uh, to find uh, basically the, 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 the values for the v, uh, v, uh, v functions for each uh, of the n states. So the first technique, the first al algorithm that we've seen is value iteration, which basically provides a fixed point iteration procedure for computing the state utilities Vs, right? And what we've seen is that uh, this can be quite simply achieved by uh, saying that you start with some utility, uh, approximate utility for the states. So you have a vector of utility values, uh, v, v. Uh, and so if we say that vi is the estimated utility uh, for value for s at iteration i, then the algorithm, what it does is to uh, iteratively uh, apply the Bellman update, which consists in updating simultaneously all the estimates so all these v-values, these approximate v-values, to make them locally consistent with the Bellman equation, right? And uh, concretely, that means that the next uh, value, so, or, so, 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 so the next value at the next iteration, uh, i plus one, for the state s is equal to the immediate reward, rs, plus uh, a one-step lookahead based on uh, the current utility values, right? And then the idea is simply to uh, repeat these Bellman updates until you converge to, uh, until you reach convergence, okay? So until uh, you don't see any more uh, changes in these uh, V values. And what we saw more specifically is that uh, not only this thing will converge, but it will converge to the optimal, to the correct V values. Then 
<coughs> nevertheless, we saw that uh, value iteration has some issues, and so an alternative is known as policy iteration, which is an algorithm that directly computes the policy instead of the state values. Uh, and it basically, this algorithm alternates uh, the two following steps, so policy evaluation and then policy improvement. So po policy evaluation is just given some current policy p, uh, pi i, then to derive the v values uh, for this policy, and we'll then will so meaning that we want to compute v for the policy pi i, and we'll denote this as v i, which is the utility of each of each state if uh, you execute that policy. Okay, which by the way it, it, it will, may not be optimal uh, yet. And so policy evaluation is quite similar to the Bellman equation, except that you don't have the max uh, in the equation because you are following uh, the policy pi i, right? So instead of taking the max over all possible actions, what you do is that you know the action that you will, will pick is the one returned by the pi function, right? And this is now much simpler because you don't have the max operator anymore, and therefore these equations become linear. And so now we, you are left with a system of n linear equations, which is something which you can solve uh, quite easily uh, uh, using standard methods for this. So this then gives you the values, uh, the, the v values for the current policy. And then the second step in policy iteration is to actually improve upon this policy and which you can do by, again, using a one-step look-ahead based on the v value that you have estimated uh, for that current policy, right? And so what you would say is that uh, the next iteration, the next policy at, uh, iteration, at the next iteration would be equal to uh, the action that maximizes the expected utility for the next state S prime. So remember this equation, the first one, and uh, actually the two of them, uh, because this is something we'll reuse today. All right, so all these things um, we've covered last week. Now we'll talk about reinforcement learning. So before we do that, I would just like to introduce the problem. And uh, so I will first show you two videos and then we'll try to discuss them. So what you'll see is a chicken uh, that uh, has some task to solve. So this was for the first one. Let's look at another one of the same kind. So what do you think of this? What just happened there? So if you analyze these two videos, uh, this wasn't actually planning. It was reinforcement learning. So there, there was this chicken uh, in some unknown Markov decision process, at least for the chicken. And uh, the goal of the chicken, of course, was to maximize uh, its reward. So to maximize the food it could eat. Uh, and quite naturally, the, the, the chicken managed to, to solve uh, this problem. Uh, but of course, uh, the, the chicken didn't know about the MDP explicitly. It didn't know in advance what was the result of its actions. And of course, and even if it, it would know about the MDP, which is just nonsense, um, it could not solve it uh, with just computations because it's just a chicken. 
Uh, but more importantly, it, it, the chicken was in a case where the MDP was unknown to it, right? And so even in, so in this case, it could not solve it, it could not make use of the algorithm that we've seen uh, to, uh, to solve the problem, right? And so what happened is that the chicken actually needed to actually uh, needed to, to, to act in the environment to actually figure out what would happen uh, depending on, it, on its action, right? So these two videos are actually, in my opinion, a, a very good illustration of reinforcement learning because it also uh, illustrates important ideas uh, that we require when we want to formally uh, solve these kind of problems. So the first one is the, is the idea of exploration, which is to say that you have to try unknown actions to get some information. And so we'll rewatch this video again. And so you will notice that uh, at the beginning, the, the, the chicken does not know what it should do, and so it will um, uh, try random actions, and then from the outcome of these actions, uh, will uh, 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 decide on what it should do, uh, do next. Very quickly, also, you see that uh, the, the chicken has figured out the problem, right? And so uh, the, that second idea is exploitation. So eventually, you have to use what you know. And, and, and as we watch the video longer, you see that uh, the, the chicken uh, then explore uh, less and less because it's just exploiting uh, the things that it has figured out. The thing, for example, with the first video that it should try to eat something on this pink uh, circle uh, because it knows it, it has figured out that it would then get a reward. The third idea is, is regret. So even if you learn intelligently, you make mistakes and that's uh, that's true. I mean, it's not too obvious here, but uh, the way it learned, the way it explored, maybe is suboptimal. So that means you will make mistakes and you will have to deal with that. The, the fourth idea is sampling. Uh, so because of chance, you have to try things repeatedly. Uh, so it might be that, okay, you observed something, but uh, this was just a fluke, a statistical fluke. And if you try that same thing again, maybe the outcome would be different. So that means you have to retry the same actions uh, several times in order to be certain that uh, you have properly figured out the environment. And then of course, it's difficult. So learning uh, while acting is much more difficult than uh, simply solving a, an already known uh, Markov decision process. So let's watch the video, the first video again, and, and try to see uh, and, and, and try to 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 see where the chicken, for example, explore, then exploit, and these other ideas. So you saw that the chicken, I mean, he, he almost always try to uh, go for the pink circle, uh, only why, once or twice it went, it went for the blue one, uh, but then he, he quickly figured out that it was uh, then, uh, it, it, it wouldn't uh, result in rewards. Um, I think the, the, the exploration exploitation is a bit more obvious for the second video, Where now, you would see that the chicken is a bit hesitating. But then he quickly figured out that it should go around this orange cone. Yeah, I try something, it doesn't work. <laughs> and then uh, go back to what it knows will work. So that's basically what we'll try to do to, to implement today, but uh, in terms of algorithm, right? And uh, I think these two videos are really strong illustrations of uh, reinforcement learning. 
uh, uh, in, in nature um, in, in the chicken. Right, so formally what we'll try to do today uh, is uh, to solve an unknown Markov decision process. Right. So we'll still assume a Markov decision process defined as before in terms of these four components, these four elements, so a set of states, a set of actions, a transition model P, and then a reward function R, right? And our goal will be the same as before. We'll try to find an optimal policy by star, uh, which then would uh, tell you what is the optimal action that you should perform uh, in any state S. Except that now we'll make things a bit more difficult in the sense that the transition model, so this conditional probability P of S prime given S and A, and the reward function R S will be unknown. Right? They will still be there, but we'll, we'd not, we, we won't know in advance what they are. Right? So that means concretely, we will not know, we do not know which states are good, nor what actions do. Right? So you, you, you could be in a state, right? but you will not be able to, 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 to call this reward function because you don't know it. And similarly, um, you, you don't know what your actions do, meaning that if you are currently in some state S and then perform some action A, you have no clue, at least at the beginning, about what will be the resulting state S prime that you will uh, uh, end into. Right? And so that means now we'll uh, have to interact, we'll have to observe and interact with the environment in order to jointly learn these dynamics and then act upon them. Right? So we'll still have the same loop. Uh, we'll be in a state that the agent know, then the agent will have to take some actions. Right? And this, the, then the next state is prime, will still be sampled from uh, a, a transition model, uh, except that this transition model will be unknown. Right? But uh, we'll still take this action and will result in some new status prime. This new status prime will then be informed to the agent together with uh, an associated uh, reward R prime, but will not know uh, how this reward was computed in the first place. All right, so we'll start easy with passive reinforcement learning. And so our goal first will just be to, uh, uh, to evaluate the goodness of a policy, right? So formally we have uh, the agent's policy pi, which is fixed. And our goal will be to learn the utility values. So V, the V value, sorry, the V values for the policy pi, uh, which gives us the goodness uh, of state S if you were to follow uh, the policy pi, right, starting from this state onward. Then <clears throat> what is also important to, 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 to keep in mind uh, in passive reinforcement learning is that the learner has no choice about what actions to take, right? Because the policy is fixed. So what actions you will perform will be informed by that fixed policy. Okay, so the agent uh, will just, for now, execute the policy and then learn uh, uh, its goodness from experience. This is also different from, so th this may look similar to what we've seen before, except that this is not actually uh, offline planning because the agent actually perform actions in the environment, right? You don't pre-compute the solution and then the act, take the action because you don't know what would be the result of uh, what you do. So you really take actions in the world and, 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 and at the same time, you evaluate the goodness of that policy that you are currently executing. So as an example, uh, this is uh, 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 an environment that I will reuse a few times today. Uh, in which there are five possible states, right? And the initial state could be either B or E. And then you have some policy which tell you uh, what action you should do, you should perform in each one of the states. 
uh, for example, if you are in state B, you could either go, uh, you, the only thing that you can do, for example, would be to go to the right, to go uh, east. If you are in, in state C, could either go up, uh, right, down, or left. But here the policy would tell you to go, which is uh, shown with these triangles, would tell you to go to D. Uh, and if you are in E, the policy would, would tell you to go up. And if you are in either state A and D, the policy would be uh, such that these would correspond basically to terminal states in which uh, you just uh, won't do anything anymore, right? Now, if this is your policy shown by these uh, blue triangles, and this, if, if this is the environment, uh, what will basically happen is that the agent will execute a set of trials, right, in this environment using that fixed policy path. Right? And these trials will generate basically trajectories, which would be a sequence of states, and then the reward that you obtain when you reach this state, then the action that you will perform uh, in this state, and then the resulting state as prime. And then you would have a repetition of this uh, state reward action state uh, tuple uh, until you reach a terminal state. Right? So, for example, the, at the first episode, uh, the first trial, if you start in state B, then you could have, for example, this uh, trajectory, which is generated by just following that policy pi. Uh, so, you would start in state B, you would collect a reward of minus one, then the policy would tell you to, to try to go east, and then you would arrive effectively in state C. Then, the next tuple, so the next uh, uh, um, transition, would be that, okay, now you've arrived in state C, uh, you collect a reward of minus one for that, then the policy would tell you to go east, uh, and then you would arrive effectively to state D. And then the next transition, in state D, you would collect a reward of plus 10, and since this is a terminal state, the only thing you could do, the only action that you could do, for example, would be to exit the environment, and then uh, there won't be any next state. Right, so which is uh, denoted by this symbol to, to just mark the end of the, 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 the trajectory. So you could repeat that, and may, maybe the second trial would give you exactly the same transitions, uh, so the, the, the three same tuples. You could also, in a next and third episode, start in state E. In state E, you would collect the reward minus one. And here the policy would tell you to go north, right? And you would then effectively arrive in state C again, in which you would collect a reward of minus one, in which then the policy would tell you to go east, and you would effectively arrive in state D. In state D, you would then collect uh, a reward of plus 10, and the only action uh, that you could perform, or the one that the policy tells you, is just to exit the environment. And finally, uh, you could have a fourth sequence, a fourth um, uh, uh, set of transitions. Again, you would start in state E, you would collect a reward of minus one, a policy would tell you to go north, you would arrive effectively in state C, in state C you would collect minus one, the policy again would tell you to go east, but you would not arrive in state D, because remember, the, the, the transitions are stochastic, uh, so it might be that the resulting net state S prime is different from what you have already observed. Right? So even though you have already observed three times that if you are in state C and go east, you arrive at D, uh, you arrive in state D, maybe there is some uh, small probability with which uh, you actually do not go to state D, but you arrive in state A. And this is what you've just observed with this uh, transition. And then in this, in, uh, so, you wanted to go east, so to go to D, but uh, you actually end up in state A. In state A, unfortunately, you would collect a reward of minus 10, and the only actions that you could perform would be to exit the maze because it's a terminal state. Right? So this is the kind of information that we'll collect by just follow following a policy in, a, in, a, in some environment. And now from this information, what we want to, to to, to, to obtain or to estimate is uh, the goodness of that policy pi. And more precisely, 
to, 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 to estimate the V value for the states if you were to follow the policy path. All right, so the first approach that we'll uh, uh, cover today is a model-based approach in which um, you will try to estimate, uh, to build an approximation of both the transition and the reward uh, models. So you will build approximate, uh, approximator for uh, P, which I will denote by P hat to say that this is an approximation of some quantity which is unknown to you, but which you are trying to estimate. And similarly for the reward, we try to estimate the reward function uh, with uh, another uh, function approximator, uh, which I denote by R hat. And we try to do that based on experiences. And then once we'll have uh, uh, built these approximations, then we'll result back to an empirical uh, Markov decision process. So we'll just make it it's just as if we were to say that the true MDP, okay, we know it's, we don't know it, but we'll, uh, we'll say that uh, the MDP is the same as the one that you obtain when you plug in this uh, approximation for the transition model and the reward function. And then that will uh, uh, put us back into uh, this uh, comfortable situation in which we have a known MDP, okay, which I will call an empirical MDP, and in which we can apply the algorithms that we have seen last week, right? So concretely, this will be this will happen in two steps. In the first step, we, we will learn an empirical MDP, meaning that we'll try to estimate this conditional probability P of S prime, the next state, when you are in state uh, S and take the action A. And we'll try to do that from empirical samples, and in particular from tra transitions S A S prime that we can collect by just executing the policy. And this is something we can do in a similar fashion uh, to the sampling algorithms uh, that we've seen in lecture five, uh, when we uh, talked about how to solve uh, uh, inference problem by sampling. We were basically building approximations of these conditional probabilities that we were after. And so we can do exactly the same in this setup, except that the sampling algorithm will be given by the policy that you follow and the, 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 the stochasticity of the environment in which you, you act, right? But otherwise you would just collect these samples and you can aggregate them together exactly in the same way using counts, for example, uh, to form an estimate of uh, these conditional probability uh, distributions. So you could, do, you could go either this way or you could also uh, build up an approximation for this conditional distribution using supervised learning as we have seen two weeks ago. And so there, what you will have is that you will collect samples S, A, and S prime, and you could say that you want to build, for example, a function, a mapping uh, between from, uh, uh, from some input, which is S, A, to some output, which is S prime. So in this case, that would then correspond to uh, a supervised uh, learning problem in which you can apply some of the algorithms, some of the models we've seen, like uh, uh, neural networks, for example. You could do similarly for uh, the rewards. Um, so in this case, we assume that the reward is, 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 is not stochastic, so it makes our life a bit simpler. So you would just have to discover what is the reward associated for each state S, right? And that would happen if you uh, explore uh, sufficiently many states in the environment. So once we've built these approximations, P, P hat and R hat, uh, what we'll do is that we'll evaluate pi, the policy that we've been following, using these approximations. And the way we'll do that uh, uh, is by simply plugging these quantities into the uh, policy evaluation equation. So, which is that equation, which I mentioned uh, when we uh, this uh, when we covered uh, policy iteration, right? In policy iteration, that's the same problem. You want to evaluate a policy, uh, pi i, 
Uh, and so that means you want to build the V values if you want to follow that policy. And that's the same. We want to do policy evaluation, except that now um, we'll plug in uh, the approximate reward and the approximate transition model. All right, so that's quite easy. So if we do that uh, from our trajectories and from the policy on that previous example, what would happen is that uh, the learn, for example, the learn transition model, if for, uh, for example, for uh, the conditional probability of reaching state C, when you start in B and then go east, is one, because this is the only thing that we've observed uh, with these two transitions there. Maybe something else happens, but uh, we don't know about it. So the only thing, the, the, the best guess that we can make is to say that uh, our estimate uh, for this condition of probability is equal to one. However, if you are in state C and then take, take the action to the east, uh, we've seen these four different transitions there. And for three of them, uh, if you take the action east from C, you actually, you end up in state D. But for one of them, uh, what you observe is that uh, we went uh, not to D, but to uh, A. And so the estimate then that we, that we can uh, obtain is to say that the condition probability of reaching D, D when you start in C and then takes the action east is uh, 0.75. And on the other end, the condition probability of A given C and east is 0.25. Right? And you could do similarly for all other uh, triples, S, A, and S prime. In terms of rewards, we have observed that in B, we collect minus 1, in C, we collect minus 1, in D, we collect plus 10, and uh, we, there is a, a fourth observation, which is, which is that in A, uh, in, in A, we observe minus 10. And actually in E also we observe that one. So we know all the rewards from these four trajectories actually. In E we would observe minus one. Now the question uh, will be, can we learn that same, uh, the same values for a fixed policy, but in a model free fashion, meaning without having to explicitly model the environment, right? So without having to learn explicitly approximations P hat and R hat, can we directly try to estimate uh, these V values uh, without that information? And so the answer is yes, and there are actually multiple ways to do that. Which is maybe surprising because when you, when you look at this equation, uh, you really need uh, which is defining the v, val the v value, uh, you really need R and P. But you can go around that. And the first way is to remember th the very first definition uh, that we give to the goodness of a policy, so uh, the, to the utility of a state. And so th th the algorithm that we, which will be based on that is called direct utility estimation or uh, also Monte Carlo evaluation. And so the, in, if you remember, the utility V pi for some state S is, uh, is, was initially defined as the expected total reward from the state onward, right? Uh, which is equal to this uh, expression. So the utility <coughs> V for a state S, if you were to follow pi, is the expected discounted, discounted reward uh, that you would obtain by following uh, the policy pi. Right? So you just execute the policy uh, uh, and then that would then give you a trajectory of state action, uh, of state reward action, uh, next state, uh, not re reward action, next state, reward, and so on. And from this trajectory, uh, well, you could plug in uh, the reward that you discount depending on the value of gamma and that would give you a realization uh, for uh, this distribution, uh, which is implicitly, which is which comes with this expectation, right? And so, 
the average value, the expected value of this realization for this sum, for this uh, total reward, is uh, the uh, utility that we want to estimate. Right? So basically, each trial, each episode, will provide a sample of that quantity right? for each visited state. And so therefore, a very simple way to estimate directly the V value uh, for a fixed policy is that at the end of each sequence, at the end, at the end of each trajectory, one can update a sample average uh, V at, uh, uh, so an estimate V at for the utilities of the state S following pi by computing the observed reward to go for each state, right? which is just by computing this thing and then updating the estimated utility for that state by keeping a running average. Right? And then in the limit of infinitely many trials, that sample average, this empirical average, will converge to these expectations that we want to estimate. So again, we can, to the, the, we can try to apply this algorithm to the same setup. Uh, where, where we still have the same policy pi and the same for trajectory. And so direct utility estimation basically provides a way to, to directly evaluate uh, these v-values. <coughs> so let's start maybe from the end of the trajectory. And so if we look, for example, at the utility of a state d, what would happen is that we have uh, three um, suffixes of trajectory, uh, this one, this one, and this one, in which if we compute the long-term reward, which is in this case equal to the local reward because this is a terminal state, we observe that uh, the, uh, the, the, the reward that we obtain is uh, plus 10 plus 10 is plus 10, so the empirical average is plus 10. Right? And this is what we report there. We can do the same for A, so it's equal to minus 10, and this is the only observations that we obtain. So the longer the long the, the long-term reward, if we were to follow pi starting from A, is minus 10. Because A is actually a terminal state, so it's equal again to the terminal uh, to the to the immediate reward that you collect in this state. For C, uh, we observe we have four different trajectories. Uh, for which we pass through the state C. <clears throat> and so the, in the first one, the, the, the total reward, the total discounted reward is equal to minus 1 plus 10, so minus 9, uh, I'm sorry, plus 9. We assume that gamma, the discount factor, is equal to 1 in this case. For the second trajectory, uh, the, uh, the Total discounted reward is again equal to minus 1 plus 10, so plus 9. For the third trajectory, it's the same, plus, uh, uh, plus 9. And then uh, for the fourth trajectory, because we observe a different transition from C, we arrive to A instead of D, uh, the long term reward that we observe is uh, minus 1, minus 10, so minus 11. So in total, if you take the average of this uh, total rewards, we have plus 9, plus 9, plus 9, so plus 27, minus uh, 11, so 16, and we, so, so, and we want to take the average, so we divide this by the number of trajectories, so 16 divided by 4 is equal to plus 4, right? And that gives us an estimate of uh, the utility of the state C when you start from when you follow policy pi. You can do the same for B. So in B, we observe we have two trajectories that pass through B. For the first one, the total reward that we uh, uh, that we observe is minus one, minus one, plus ten. So it's plus eight. And for the second trajectory, it's again the same. It's minus 1, minus 1, plus 10, so plus 8. And the empirical average of plus 8 and plus 8 is plus 8, right? And this is the value that we report uh, in, this, in this set. And finally, for E, 
we, we have these two other trajectories. In the first one, we observe that the total discounted reward is equal to minus 1, minus 1 plus 10, so plus 8. And for the second trajectory, the uh, total discounted reward is equal to minus 1, minus 1, minus 10, so minus 12. And now if you take the empirical average of plus 8 and minus 12, then you obtain uh, minus 2. And that's the value that then uh, you, you have estimated for, uh, for E. So this would work, and this would actually converge uh, to the true values. However, um, this may take a long time uh, to, 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 to reach. And one thing that you can notice from these uh, estimated values is that the, uh, the goodness of B and E are quite different. But it's quite strange because if both B and E go to C under pi, how can their values be so different? Right. And it's even more weird because we know that the reward that you would collect at either B or E are actually the same. So th th their reward should actually be identical in this case. But the algorithm computes something different, which and it says that the estimated utility should be plus 8 for B and uh, and uh, minus two for E. Well, the, the thing that the algorithm does not exploit is, that, uh, the, is the fact that the state values are not independent. And this is obvious because uh, these state values, they obey the Bellman equations for a fixed policy. We know that the, value, uh, the state values are connected to each other through the Bellman equation. And so in the case of a fixed policy, we know that the value of a state is connected uh, through the value of the neighboring states in this way. But this is an information, this is a relation which is not uh, exploited by direct utility estimation. Right? And therefore, because of that, it actually misses opportunities for learning and then would take a very long time, meaning it would take uh, many, many transitions, uh, many, many uh, simulations, uh, many, many um, trajectories uh, to obtain uh, good enough estimates for the values. All right. So instead of trying to directly estimate in some kind of uh, maybe too naive way, uh, there is a, a, a better algorithm which you can use to estimate these values, which is known as temporal difference learning. And so temporal difference learning, so I will call that TD learning. So every time you, you hear TD, it means temporal difference. So TD learning will consist in updating the V estimates uh, for the state S following pi each time the agent uh, experience, uh, experiences a transition S so a transition such that you start in S, you collect some reward because you have reached this uh, state S, then you perform some action A, which is uh, 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 enforced by the policy pi that you want to evaluate, and then you arrive to some new state S point, right? So we'll be exactly in this setup. We start in some state S, then we don't have any choice about the actions that we can take. It's, it's, in, it's informed by the policy pi, uh, which gives us an action. Then we arrive to a chance node, right, uh, which is controlled in a way by the environment, and, uh, so, and which is defined in terms of the state, the starting state and the action. And then this chance, so this, this chance node is as if uh, it was taking an action that leads you then to a, a, a new state as point. Then what happens is that uh, each time a transition from S to S prime occurs, then uh, the TD update that will uh, uh, define will try to steer the estimated V value to better agree with the Bellman equations for a fixed policy. And explicitly, the update that will apply will be that the new value 
uh, for our estimate of uh, the s following pi is equal uh, or becomes, so this is an assignment, uh, is the previous estimate plus some uh, adjustment uh, which is equal to alpha, where alpha is a learning rate parameter of the TD error, the temporal difference error, which is defined as the difference between uh, the reward that you've collected uh, in that transition that you've just experienced plus the discounted uh, V value at the next state according to your, own, your current estimate, right? So plus gamma times V pi for uh, S prime, the state that you've just reached in that transition, minus uh, the V value for the starting state S. <clears throat> and so you can view this equation as if V pi for the state S is the prediction that you are making for the long-term reward uh, that you would collect st starting from S then following pi and R plus uh, the discounted reward as the next state as the target that you want to estimate. And so if you observe that uh, for example, R plus gamma times V is uh, uh, strictly larger or larger than V for S, V of S, then that means that that prediction actually underestimate the values that you should have uh, uh, predicted. Right? And so in this case, uh, so if Yeah, if you do an underestimation, then that means that the TD error will be positive, and that makes sense. That means that you should make a tiny adjustment in this direction to increase the value of uh, the V uh, estimate for S, because you are currently uh, underestimating that value. And on the other hand, if R plus the discounted reward, the, the discounted value of the next state is smaller, than uh, the, the V value for the state S, then that means uh, that the predictions that you're making, it actually overestimates the, the, the real value. And therefore, in this case, this TD error would be negative because since you are underestimating, you should make, you should try to decrease your current estimation, right? And this is what you, you, will, you will do. And so that comes simply from the fact that we want, uh, yes, what we want is for our v-value to try to agree as much as possible uh, with uh, this, uh, this Bellman equation for our fixed policy. And that means the, the v-value that we are currently estimating should be as close as possible from this uh, other side of the equation. So you can view this, so, uh, so, so there are multiple ways to look at this uh, TD update. Uh, one is to view the TD update as a single gradient descent step on the squared error between the target, uh, which is R plus gamma times, uh, so R plus the uh, discounted uh, utility for the next state and the prediction V for the, current, the starting state S. And this is something we'll reuse when we talk about q -learn. Another a second way to view, this, to, to, to view this equation is uh, to just rearrange a bit the term and to, 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 to observe that the TD update can be expressed in terms of some exponential moving average. And so the update that you would do is just equivalent to uh, just forgetting a bit about your current estimate. And so you do that by multiplying your current estimate by one uh, minus alpha, and then to use uh, the, the, the observations that you have just collected uh, to, uh, to, to make the update, right? And so to use this value instead. And so you take this uh, weighted average of the current estimate, weighted by one minus alpha, and the observed transition 
uh, that you would that you would weight by alpha. And so intuitively, it just means that uh, uh, it, 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 it's as if you were making recent sample uh, samples more important because you forget basically about the past uh, with this exponential moving average. But this is actually fine because you know that this distant value uh, that, you, that you computed from earlier iterations were wrong in any case. Right? Because initially uh, you don't know anything about the, the real B values. All right, so let's apply that again to our, same, to our environment with the five uh, states. Here we'll still assume that gamma, the discount factor, is equal to 1 and with an additional parameter alpha, which is the, that learning rate, and we'll uh, 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 fix it to 0.5. And so when you run TD uh, learning, uh, what you do is that you update the, uh, the V values at each transition that the agent experiences, right? So the first transition that we could, so we could say that we start in this, uh, so th that the agent is currently in state B, and its current estimate for the state is 0, 0, 0, 0, and 8 for D, but 0 uh, for all the others. And then it experiences uh, the transition uh, B in which uh, it, the transition, the transition uh, B minus 1 is C, so it starts in B, for which it collected a reward of minus 1, then follows uh, the action uh, uh, defined by the policy, in this case to go east, and then it would arrive in, in the next state S prime, uh, which is uh, in this case C, right? And now, and then the TD update that you would perform would be to say that your new estimate uh, for the V value of P, uh, according to policy pi, is your current estimate plus some correction, right? Which is given by alpha times the TD error uh, that, you, uh, that you have. And the TD error is defined by the immediate reward that you've collected in state B, plus the discounted estimated utility for the next state, in this case C, minus your current estimate for the starting state, in this case D. So if you replace all these expressions by, by their actual numerical values, what we would obtain is that this is equal to zero, because this is our current estimate for the V value at B, uh, plus 0.5, the learning rate, defined here. Uh, then the reward that you collect uh, for this transition, so it's minus one, plus um, this term, so it would be one times the current estimate uh, for the utility of the state C, which is currently equal to zero, so it would be equal to zero, minus your current utility, your current utility estimate for the state B, which is zero as well. And so when you just compute this, you obtain an update, which is changing the V value for B to minus 0.5. Could do the same for a second transition, in which we start in C, collect a reward of minus one, then uh, we uh, go east, or try to go east, and then arrive in state D. Again, we would have a steady update, in which we uh, now update uh, the, the, the estimate for the state C, not for the state B, because C is the starting state, and then we say that, okay, I will make uh, an adjustment of this estimate, by just looking at the TD error I'm making and then uh, weighting this, this TD error by this learning parameter alpha. Again, when we replace all uh, these expressions by, the, by their numerical values, uh, we obtain now a, a, a TD update, which is equal to zero plus 0.5 times minus one, the reward that we, uh, the, the reward that we collect in state C, plus eight, so plus eight because it's equal to uh, gamma, which is equal to one, plus the current estimate for the, re the resulting state, D, which is equal to eight, right? Minus zero because our current estimate for C is equal to zero. And after this update, then the, the new estimate for the V value for the state C would be equal to 3.5. 
what you can see here is that uh, uh, you should notice how the large value, the large reward, uh, which in this case is the reward that you collect instead d, uh, eventually propagates back to the states that can be used to reach this, uh, this, uh, this state uh, with a large reward. And if you, if you were, for example, to experience again that same transition, uh, then because B is connected to C, then it would also then uh, become much larger than uh, minus 0.5, right? Uh, because uh, if you can uh, reach C, that means uh, potentially you will get a good reward because C is itself connected to D, which uh, gives rise to a very uh, large reward of plus A. All right, so if you repeat this, um, then uh, in terms of, you could wonder what would happen in terms of convergence. The, what, to what uh, values uh, will you converge? So one thing that you can notice is that the TD update involves only the observed successor S prime, whereas the actual Bellman equations for fixed policy involves all possible next states, right? If you look at the policy evaluation equation for a fixed policy, this one, it, it involves all possible next state S prime. But in the TD update that we use, we only make use of the successor S prime that you actually observe in the transition that you experience. So this is a bit different, but in average, that will be the same. And you can show formally, uh, actually, that the average value uh, of the estimate for Vs following pi will converge to the correct value. So at some point you may reach uh, an equilibrium distribution uh, in which this V value will keep changing as you experience transition. But if you then look at the average value of these V estimates, this average value will converge to the correct value. And so this is true when the learning rate is fixed. If you change alpha, the learning rate, from a fixed parameter value to a function that now decreases as the number of times a, a state has been visited uh, increases, so the more you visited the state, uh, the smaller should the learning rate be, then the v, the, your V estimate uh, for S following pi will itself converge to the correct value. Right? So not only the average value will converge to the correct value, but also the, the value itself of your estimate will converge to the correct value. All right, so I think it's a, it's a good time to, 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 to take a break. Um, in the second part of today's lecture, we'll now talk about active reinforcement learning uh, in, for which the policy is not fixed anymore. And so we'll try to both evaluate uh, the policy, but the main thing that we'll uh, try to, to, to do, of course, is to find, to improve a policy in order to find the optimal policy in this unknown environment. All right, so we'll take a break and uh, we'll resume in 10 minutes, let's say at 10, uh, 20. Again, if you have questions, feel free to, to use the chat and I will be happy to, to explain things if uh, some of my explanations were uh, not too clear today.
All right, so we'll resume. So what we've seen in this, this first part of today's lecture is how to estimate the utility of a fixed policy in an unknown environment. And so this is what I was uh, calling passive reinforcement learning. And we've seen uh, several ways to do that. The first one is a model-based approach in which you uh, first estimate the transition model and the reward function uh, from uh, the uh, trajectory that you collect by interacting uh, with the environment and following that fixed policy. And once you have that, then you plug them back into the policy evaluation equation to form approximate uh, estimate uh, to, to, to form estimates of uh, the V values. Um, yeah, by the way, strictly speaking, you should have uh, the uh, uh, it should be V pi of S and not V of S. Uh, these are not optimal. Uh, they do not correspond to the optimal policy. Uh, so that's the first approach. Then we have seen, we have seen two model-free uh, estimation strategies that you could use. So strategies that would that you could use to still uh, uh, estimate these V values for pi, but without explicitly passing by, uh, by uh, approximators for the transition models and the reward functions. And so you could either do that with direct utility estimation, but it's quite inefficient. And uh, the other way you could do that, uh, it's uh, with uh, temporal difference learning, TD learning, which consists in making use of every transition that the agent experiences in order to adjust uh, using a, a signal to temporal difference error to adjust your current estimate of the V value. All right, so now moving on to active reinforcement learning, our goal now will be to learn that optimal policy that we are after, right? And so that means the agent's policy would not be fixed anymore. And its goal will be to learn the policy pi star or equivalently the state value Vs, where Vs, uh, if you remember our notations, correspond to the V values uh, as if you were following the optimal the optimal policy, sorry. And now what is also different from before is that the learner is no longer passive. It's actively making choices. It's actively picking the actions that it can take uh, in the environment instead of blindly following the, some policy pi. We'll see that in order to properly solve this problem, uh, we'll have a, some, some fundamental trade-off will, which will appear, which will be uh, this uh, famous exploration versus exploitation uh, uh, trade-off, which we've already uh, talked about uh, a few lectures ago. I think it was in adversarial uh, search algorithms when we talked about, uh, for example, MCTS, a Monte Carlo tree search, uh, in which we had the same kind of issues about whether we should either keep exploring uh, states or nodes that you don't know much about because you've not visited them uh, many times yet or rather should you explore part of the search space that you know is interesting and this is uh, exploitation All right so as before we we'll see two ways to solve uh, basically reinforcement learning the first one is a model-based approach so we'll talk uh, i will uh, 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 so I will define that under the name of model-based learning. And so in this case, it's actually not too difficult. Uh, so the passive model-based agents that we have seen uh, uh, in the first part of today's lecture can actually be made active by instead finding the optimal policy pi star from the empirical MDP that we have uh, uncovered. So Remember, in, in the model-based approach, what you do is that you follow some policy, it gives you trajectories from which then you uh, estimate the transition model and the reward. And what we did so far was just to evaluate the goodness, so the v-value following that policy. Right? But if we have estimates for, for the good estimates for the uh, transition and the reward functions, 
then we could, instead of just evaluating that policy that we followed, we could actually just uh, derive the optimal policy pi star instead, using then the Bellman equation. And so, for example, having obtained a utility v, uh, and uh, using the optimal, sorry, so you could uh, uh, then uh, uh, go back to the Bellman equation from which Using, for example, value iteration, you could, uh, you could uh, derive the v-value for that optimal policy. Right? And after having defined uh, or uh, derived this v-value, you can obtain finally the optimal action uh, by uh, a simple one-step lookahead to maximize the expected utility. So the opti optimal action, uh, which is the one produced by that optimal policy would be simply equal to, to the action that leads to the uh, largest expected reward at the next state s prime. Except that now you would not use the actual uh, transition model, which you don't know, but you would use uh, your approximate transition model that you've estimated from the trajectories. All right. Unfortunately, if you do that, it will just not work. And so in practice, so if you, for example, uh, try to apply that in our grid world environment from the pre previous lecture, uh, in, in the textbook, they make this experiment. And uh, what they show is that uh, the agent basically does not learn uh, the, the either the, 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 the correct optimal policy, nor uh, uh, the correct v-values associated with this optimal policy. So that's bad, um, but it, that thing that I just explained, uh, it makes sense. It should make sense. If we have good enough transition and uh, reward, re good enough models for the transition and the reward, then the empirical MDP should not be that far off from the uh, true MDP for which we want to find the optimal uh, action, the optimal policy. Well, that's true, that would be true, but the issue is that the, the estimate, the, the function approximators, uh, the, so, sorry, the, the approximation for the transition model and the, uh, the reward are actually usually not very good uh, ap uh, approximations of uh, the true quantities that we want to estimate. And so therefore, for this reason, uh, uh, you will not then obtain the optimal policy. Right? So basically what happens is that the learned transition and reward model, p hat and r hat, are not the same as the true environment. And that ca they can be quite far off from them. And so that results in the fact that what is optimal under this learned model can be quite suboptimal in the true environment. Right? And this is what would happen, and this is why this, uh, when you make this experiment, you observe that the, uh, the, the, the optimal policy that you estimate is actually not uh, very good and far from being optimal. Okay, and so the issue stems from the fact that we based our estimations on trajectories that maybe were not uh, sufficiently covering the, the, the state space or the state action space. Uh, because we were guided by this initial policy that uh, we have been executing. And so maybe when you follow that policy, uh, there are entire parts of the uh, state action space uh, that, uh, that, that you will never ever discover, right? So that means maybe you should explicitly explore instead of just following blindly the policy and assuming that the trajectories that you would then obtain would be sufficient to uh, obtain uh, transition and reward models that would be in close agreement with the, with the true environment. And so this is precisely this exploration uh, dilemma, exploration, exploitation dilemma uh, that I was uh, mentioning before, uh, which also happened with this uh, chicken experiment. And 
it's so what, what we can say also is that actions basically will do more than just provide rewards according to the current learn model they will also contribute indirectly to learning the true environment right so by when you take some actions of course your goal uh, with your reinforcement learning agent is just to maximize the reward but indirectly also your goal because initially you don't know too much about the environment is to discover about this environment because you know quite well that the better you know about the environment the better you will be at actually uh, collecting this long-term expected reward and so this is this exploitation exploration trade-off exploitation because you should follow actions that maximize the rewards under the current model that you've learned but at the same time you should explore so you should follow actions to explore and learn more about the true environment right so then the question would be how should you explore so there there are plenty of strategies uh, will not cover uh, uh, many of them just a very simple one or two simple ones um, and but the simplest of all uh, would be simply to force exploration randomly and so from time to time with a small priority epsilon what you would do would be that instead of following the, 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 your current estimate of the best policy, you should act randomly. So just take a random action. And for all the other transitions, for all the other times where you have to take an action, so with the, com with the priority which is large and equal to the complement of epsilon so to uh, with a probability of one minus epsilon then you would follow the current policy and then what would happen is that as long as epsilon is strictly positive uh, epsilon greedy so this uh, exploration so epsilon greedy is the name to this random exploration strategy epsilon greedy uh, will eventually explore the space and so that will work so eventually you will have visited, uh, you will have collected uh, sufficiently many uh, uh, transitions such that you would then be able to correctly estimate the transition and the reward functions. And then from there on, you plug them in into uh, your MDP, you solve it. For example, let's say with value iterations that give you the, the, the state values. And then from them, uh, you infer the uh, optimal policy with a one-step lookalike. Uh, procedure. So that would work, but at the same time, it would also keep trashing around once learning is done. So if there are parts of the space that you've already visited many times, and, and you know it's, it's well covered, maybe you should, when you are in this situation, you should stop uh, performing random actions. You, just, you should just, in this case, follow your current policy. And so the, then the, the next question would be, okay, this would be how to explore, but when to explore now? Um, and so a better idea would be to explore areas whose badness or goodness is not yet established, right? And once it is established, then you should stop exploring. And so one way to do that uh, formally would be to say that instead of using the or trying to estimate the true uh, uh, state utilities, we will uh, wrap uh, uh, the, 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 the true state utilities into a new uh, optimistic estimate V plus of S, right? Uh, <coughs> that will uh, improve uh, uh, using the same kind of strategy as before. Uh, so, for example, with value iteration, we would improve it by uh, uh, making this uh, value iteration update, uh, which is equal to uh, so the, 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 the optimistic estimate of the utility of a state S at the next iteration one, i plus 1 would be equal, for example, if you observe a transition and a reward in state S uh, to that reward plus the discounted utility of now some function of the expected uh, utility for the next state s prime 
the expected optimist, optimistic utility, so it's V plus. And this function also depends on some uh, order value n, which is uh, correspond to the number of times uh, action A has been tried in state S. And so this f function will call it the exploration function, and this is how we'll uh, try to adapt between uh, exploring more if you have visited less, uh, if you have experienced experience less some uh, state action uh, pair, and on the other hand to, uh, oh, what, what did I say? So in this case, you should visit more if you have experience, experience, experience that transition less. And you should explore less if you have already experienced this transition many times, right? So there you have uh, quite some freedom in how you can set this f function. Uh, but a, a good rule of thumb would be simply to say that uh, this f function uh, should be increasing in the expected estimated value, right? Uh, so the the the, the the more promising is the next status prime. Um, uh, the, the more you should exploit the state, but at the same time, it should be decreasing in the number of times you have experienced the transition SA. Right? So it should be decreasing in N. And for example, a simple choice would be to say that F of V and N is equal to V plus K over N. So what will happen is that as you explore, <coughs> as you uh, experience more and more uh, uh, a transition uh, SA, then this second term will vanish, right? And it will then reduce back to the uh, original V values. And on the other hand, if N is small, uh, then on purpose, you will overestimate the, uh, the, the actual utility of that state because you want just to explore it uh, and to be sure that you capture uh, the correct relation. All right, and that's about it for the model-based uh, approach. So if you use this strategy, but uh, with this, uh, uh, so th this model-based learning uh, strategy, but instead of following poli that, that policy, you also, for example, uh, make use of epsilon greedy uh, or uh, of such strategy, then you will uh, actually uh, find at the end an optimal policy. A second way to do that uh, is to go for a, a model free approach. Um, and, and so we can uh, adapt uh, the temporal difference uh, estimation to uh, actually learn an optimal policy. So one thing you may have noticed is that although uh, temporal difference learning uh, provides a way to estimate the uh, V value uh, for a policy pi, and it does that in a model free fashion, we would st still have to learn a transition model uh, P of S prime given S and A to choose an action if we were to base uh, the, this policy on a one-step lookalike, for example, in, in order to improve that policy. So, for example, if we... Uh, let me find it. So we could, since we have estimated the, poly, the, the V value for something's policy in a model free fashion with the TD learning, uh, we could obtain a better uh, policy if we could compute this equation, right? But this would not be possible in a model free, in a model free scenario because we would re it would require to know or to estimate this transition model. And this is something we don't want uh, to do explicitly.
All right, but there is an indirect way to, to still be able to, to, to derive an optimal policy in a, in a, in a variant of QD learning. But before we do that, uh, I need to introduce a new, a new concept, uh, which is the concept of, of, a state action, of, a sta of state action values, uh, or Q states. Um, so before, in the previous lecture, we defined the state value Vs of some state S as the expected utility starting in state S and then, so where a state S is represented by one of these uh, blue triangles, and then acting optimally, right? This is what we've been using so far. Uh, now, we can similarly define the state action value Q of a pair S and A of some Q state, where a Q state is simply a pair state action, which basically corresponds just to a, to, a, to, to, to a state which is a chance node, right? Defined by, a, by this pair S and A. And we'll say that the state action value Q is the expected utility starting out having taken action A in state S and thereafter acting optimally. Yeah. So it's almost the same as the v-value, in which we, we say we start in state v and then we act optimally. Now, with, a, with, a, with, with q, we say that we start in state s, we take action a, and then thereafter we act optimally. Now, what is nice with this uh, new concept is that the optimal policy pi star can be defined in two different ways. It can be defined as before, so in terms of the v-values. So the optimal action that you should take in state S is the action which is for which the expected uh, v-value at the next state is maximum. Right? Or what you could just say is that uh, using these q values is that the optimal action that you should follow is the one for which the Q value is the largest when you start in S. Because you know that after that, you will keep acting optimally. So you just have to keep, uh, to, 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 to go over all possible actions and evaluate their goodness together with S uh, through this Q function, and then take the largest, uh, t t t t take as action the one which leads to the largest uh, Q value. We can also redefine Bellman equations for Q, right? So we have this relation that uh, the utility of a state S, so the, the V value for a state S, is equal to the uh, uh, maximum Q value over all the possible actions. Because this max over A is what you would do uh, with this by following the optimal policy. So since we have this relation, the Q values, QSA, can be recursively defined as uh, it's the immediate reward that you collect uh, in state S. Then you follow action A, and then you keep acting optimally, right? And if you were to act optimally, that means you would follow uh, the state S prime for which the, the, the V value is, is the largest, right? Uh, so Q of SA would be equal to the reward in state S plus the discounted uh, expected reward uh, if you were to follow the action A over all the possible uh, re resulting next, next state S prime. And now, since we said that V of S is, can be defined as the maximum of the Q value with respect to A, that means we can redefine V of S prime as the maximum over the Q values uh, starting from S prime and then taking some next action uh, A prime, right? And so as for value iteration, that last equation can be used as an update equation for fixed point iteration procedure that then would calculate the Q values. However, we would still have the same issues. If we, if we wanted to do that, we would have to know this transition model, which is there in the middle of the equation. And that's something we don't want to do. But if we had access to it, we could uh, similarly uh, run 
uh, a fixed point iteration procedure almost identical to value iteration but to compute these q values well the good news is that we can actually adapt our temporal difference learning uh, to uh, uh, not estimate the v values but to estimate the q values and so <clears throat> the state action values QSA can be learned uh, in a model free fashion, basically uh, using this temporal difference approach. And that would be known as QLearn. So quite simply, we would define it as, uh, we would define QLearning as an algorithm in which you would update your current estimate of the Q value, QSA, each time again the agent experiences a transition uh, exactly in the same way as before for TD learning. So transition S, R, A, and S prime. Uh, <clears throat> and then the update equation for Q learning now would be an update equation not on the V value but on the Q values. And so we would have that QSA would be equal to our current estimate QSA plus uh, some adjustment. Uh, for which the, 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 the signal that we use to make the adjustment is given again by the temporal difference error, except that now it's defined with respect to the Q values, in which we use uh, instead this relation. And again, we don't have this uh, expectation uh, uh, when we make the TD update because we know that when we make these updates repeatedly then in expectations that would be identical right and as before we'll make either uh, will either decrement uh, uh, if uh, the, our estimates if our prediction is uh, uh, overestimates the true value and on the other hand we will uh, increment our current estimate if that current estimate is underestimating the true value. So depending on the sign of this quantity there, uh, we uh, either increase or decrease the Q value. And so that's very nice because now, since we know that the Q values are tied to the optimal policy uh, through this equation, so uh, the, the optimal policy should be uh, so the optimal action that you uh, should perform in state S should be the one for which the Q value is maximum. Then that means a TT agent that learns Q values in this way does not need a model, uh, does not need a transition model. And it does not need it neither for learning nor even for selecting the action that it should perform. So that means now we have an algorithm which is completely model free uh, Never uh, we have had to uh, build explicit uh, models for the transition or the reward uh, functions. And only from these Q values we'll be able then to derive the optimal policy and we'll be able to uh, 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 improve them uh, through this algorithm. And so the, 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 the final algorithm that we arrived at is the following, uh, which in the textbook is uh, called the Q learning agent, which receives as at, uh, at each step uh, a percept, then return an action. Uh, and the, the percept that uh, the agent uh, collect, that the agent receives simply indicates the, cur the current new state S prime and the reward signal R prime. And then in the memory of the Q learning agent, we have Q, which is a table of action values indexed by state and action, and initially they are all set to zero. So that means concretely that this function in the agent program will be implemented as a, simply a large table uh, in which each entry is identified by a, a pair state and action. And initially all these values would be set to zero. Then we would also maintain uh, the number of times we have experienced uh, 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 the action A in state S. So we have this N uh, table, which is the table of frequencies for state action pairs. Again, they would all be set initially to zero. And also we would maintain uh, three other local variables, S, A, and R. So S, the previous state, 
a the action that we did in this state to uh, arrive to uh, f prime, and r the reward that we collected in s. Okay, and then from this transition, what would basically happen is one of these TD updates, but on the Q value. So <clears throat> if the transition, if the state that we, if the current, if the previous state S uh, is uh, terminal, then that means uh, we, we don't have to do anything and the reward is equal to uh, uh, and the Q value is equal to the reward that you collect. Um, if on the other hand, N uh, S is not null, then that you should increment, uh, you should increment uh, the, the, the counter for, for this transition, um, these frequency values, and then you make the, the, the TD update uh, for Q learning. So that means you would update the entry corresponding to, S, to, to, the, to the pair state and action, S and A. And you would, um, what? You would say it's equal to uh, alpha times the TD error, okay, which is defined as before times n, uh, the, the, times the frequency, the number of times you have visited uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this state action uh, pair. So that means basic, no, sorry, well, sorry, forget what I said. So the, the way this algorithm is, is, is defined is that the learning rate alpha now is no longer a fixed parameter, but it's a function of the number of times you've visited uh, a particular uh, state action pair because what we want is to ensure convergence. And so basically what this algorithm is already doing is uh, this. Um, so it changes alpha from a fixed parameter to a function that would decrease as the number of times a state has been visited, except that now we are not talking about state S, but about Q state S A, right? And this ensures that depending on how you would implement this alpha function, that the algorithm, that the Q value would converge to the correct Q, Q values, right? So you have some learning rate, and then you multiply this learning rate by the temporal difference error, as, defined, uh, as we said, and then uh, you, you just take the next step. Uh, so you say that the next action uh, that you should perform is the one uh, for which the exploration function is maximum. Okay, so this is also indirectly how the agents would be exploring the entire uh, space because we are using uh, 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 this exploration function when we decide the actual actions that we will perform. Right? And again, this is a function of the Q value and the number of times we have experienced that particular uh, Q state. Right? Then uh, the previous state becomes the, 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 the new state S prime and the previous uh, and the previous reward be becomes the uh, the current reward r prime and then we return the action that we want to perform which is s and then we just iterate like this uh, in a loop so this may seem very easy but uh, in this very short pseudocode what you arrive to is an agent which is capable of making uh, decision in an unknown environment, even though this environment also could be stochastic, eventually this very simple pseudocode will uh, lead to an optimal agent. Because indeed, in terms of convergence, we can formally prove, but we will not do it uh, within the scope of this course, that Q-learning Q converges to an optimal policy even when acting, when acting suboptimally. By that I mean that actually the agent will not be, I mean, this agent may not be optimal because it would follow this uh, exploration function, which uh, at times would just uh, do uh, uh, random actions, for example. And that would be suboptimal by definition. Uh, but even if that's true, 
uh, we can show that Q learning will converge to the optimal policy in any case. And so this is called off policy learning because you are actually learning the optimal policy, even though the policy that you are using to explore the to explore and act in the environment is not the, the same policy. And in this case, what happens is that the, the policy that you actually use in the environment is this mix between exploration and exploitation. Of course, there are some technical caveats. Uh, the first one is that this is only true, of course, if you explore enough. Uh, so that will depend on how you have implemented this F function. Uh, it's also only true if the learning rate eventually becomes small enough. But so that's only true depending on how you implement this alpha function. Uh, and also, as a matter of fact, the, that learning rate should not decrease too quickly because otherwise you may end up in some uh, local minima and uh, the corresponding, the associated policy then would be suboptimal. But if these assumptions are met, then uh, you would obtain an agent with, which would find the optimal policy which in my opinion is, is quite elegant, given that, I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, basically there is just one or two equations, the TD update equation, and then the exploration equation. So with two equations, you arrive, uh, which are quite simple, uh, just uh, sums, differences, and uh, a small adjustment, uh, and that's it. Uh, it's, it's quite elegant and, 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 and quite strong, I, I think, to, to uh, to, to arrive to something, to an algorithm, which then would produce uh, the optimal behavior in this unknown and stochastic environment. All right. So we are almost to the point where we could use this thing in practice, uh, but not just yet. So if you use basic view learning, as you've just seen in the previous slide, what you need to do to run this algorithm is to have a table for all Q values. So for all Q values S and A. And so when you think about it in realistic situation, there is no way you will possibly learn about every single state because the state space is so huge uh, that uh, you, you, there is no hope that you will be able to visit them all in training, during training. And in many other situations, there are just too many states to just define and to store this table in memory. So just for practical reasons, this will not work. So what you want to do instead is to be able to generalize. So to learn, basically to learn uh, about uh, yeah, that, that sentence, wait, uh, I, sh I should rephrase this. Uh, what I wanted to say is that from only a small number of training states uh, that you gather from experience, you would like to know more than about these states only. You would like to go outside and, and generalize that experience to new and similar situations. But when you say it like this, it's just nothing else than supervised machine learning. This is what we covered in lecture seven. Uh, we want from a few training examples from some training data to uh, fit some model that hopefully should generalize outside of this training data. So even though uh, we would experience only a few uh, state action pairs, well, ultimately what we would like to be able to do is to generalize to unseen, uh, to uh, state action pairs that you've never seen before. We would like to also to be able to estimate a good enough Q values. And this is nothing else than a, a supervised machine learning problem. So concretely, let's, for example, take this uh, scenario where we would have a Q-learning agent for Pac-Man, right? Uh, and we would implement it exactly by following this uh, algorithm. Now, if we discover, for example, that in this state, that, that this state is bad, right? Because we, 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 we just encounter this very particular situation and then the long-term total reward that we would collect would be quite low because obviously a Pac-Man would be killed in this case. Then if you just follow blindly the naive Q-learning that you've seen, then in this other situation, then we'll know nothing about it. And we will not be able to estimate a good Q-value. 
And the reason is that this corresponds to a new state, which is, which is just different from the state A. Even though when we look at it as humans, so it's, it's just the same. It's just the, the fact that uh, Pac-Man is enclosed between these two goals and has no way to escape from them. But strictly speaking, from the point of view of states, mathematically, this would be different. And therefore, that means we would not have any entries in our Q-table corresponding to this new state P. So even though we know about A, we would not be able to figure out what would happen in B. And even worse, we, would, we wouldn't even know anything about this one, which is almost the same as state A, except that there is this tiny difference. There is just one dot of difference in a region which is not important at all. Uh, but again, that would correspond to a different entry in the Q table. And for this reason, uh, we would not have uh, uh, any estimate uh, for this state. So that's something we want to fix, and that we can fix uh, with uh, machine learning. So again, what we'll do, what we could do, is to instead describe a state S using a vector, uh, a feature-based uh, vector representation. And so we'll say that now a state S uh, is represented as a vector X of values, and you would have D such values, that are defined uh, as features. And features would be functions fk uh, from state to real numbers. And we would like, for example, these uh, feature functions to capture important properties of the state. So example features could be that, uh, would, could, could be, for example, the distance to the closest ghost from Pac-Man, uh, the distance to the closest dots, uh, or uh, the number of ghosts uh, and many other things. Uh, there you would need to be creative if you want to define this uh, feature function explicitly. And then what would happen is that different state S then could have, uh, for example, the same uh, vector representation, feature-based vector representation, or if they are different, but uh, semantically almost the same, uh, they could have uh, vector representations that are uh, close uh, to each other according to some uh, distance function. So we could do that for uh, states, but uh, we could similarly describe a Q state, so a pair state action with also features, uh, so for which the feature functions would be defined uh, in terms of both the state S and the action A. And now that we are, we are equipped with this uh, feature-based representation of our states, we can define an approximate version of Q-learning, which I will call approximate Q-learning, uh, and in which we'll basically uh, replace the Q-table uh, with uh, a machine learning model, with a function approximator. And so one of the function approximator we've seen is, for example, to uh, the, the linear model, uh, in which what we want to do to, 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 to what we postulate is that uh, the output value, which in this case would be the Q value that we want to estimate, is a linear function of the input values. And the input values, in this case, would be the elements from our feature-based vector representation. Right? And so we would say that, uh, that we express the Q value uh, for state S in action A as some weighted combination uh, uh, some linear combination of the features for this state as this new state S A uh, um, with some vector W which correspond to the parameters of the linear model, then then we would have to learn. Right? But if these parameters are fixed, then uh, every time you encounter a state S A that you've already seen, or even a new one then you would just compute uh, this uh, linear combination and that would then produce the Q values that you should use uh, for this, uh, state, uh, uh, this Q state SA. Now, of course, we, we don't know, uh, we could do that, uh, but uh, how should we set uh, the, the, the parameters of our linear model? So how should we set the coefficients W that we put in front of each of the feature uh, values. Well, we can actually do the same kind of TD update, but now 
instead of doing uh, the, uh, the, 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 the TD update on the Q values, we would do them on the parameters, on the coefficients. So upon the transition, uh, a transition S, R, A, and S prime, the update, the TD update, would become an update that would uh, adjust the value of W by again uh, looking at the TD error, multiplying it with alpha, and then what is different from before is that we would also multiply uh, this quantity by the feature value associated to the coefficient k for that particular uh, transition, that particular Q state SA. And we would do that for all coefficients WK. Okay, th there is a question, I will come back to it after that. And so you, you may wonder, wh why do we do this? Uh, where does that come from? Um, so in, in, if you remember linear regression from lecture seven, um, if you imagine that uh, we had only one point X, uh, one vector X with uh, features F1 to FD, right? Then if your model is a, is a, is a linear model uh, to do linear regression, what we've seen is that um, the uh, objective function that we would like, for example, to minimize as a consequence of doing maximum likelihood estimation on, 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 on assuming some practic model between uh, on, on y given x uh, is equal to the square error loss, right? And so what you should do is to adjust the w parameter to minimize as much as possible the square error loss, which is defined as the square error between the quantity that you want to predict, y, and your prediction which in this case is defined in terms of this linear combination between the features, uh, the component of your single point X, uh, and this, uh, 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 this coefficients uh, W. Now, if you minimize this, uh, well, one way to minimize it is to do a one step of gradient descent. And so what you need to do gradient descent is to define the gradient of this loss uh, with respect to each parameter, right? So the partial derivative of that criterion with respect to uh, any uh, coefficients wk would be equal to the partial derivative of this expression with respect to wk, uh, which is, corresponds, if you do some calculus, to minus uh, the difference, uh, the, the minus y minus uh, your prediction times f of k. So that means to change, to adapt the, uh, the, the W, to improve the, the W parameter such that you will decrease this quantity. The update that you should take is to update WK in the opposite direction of this gradient with a step equal to alpha, right? And so when you plug all these things together, this is the update equation that you would then use in gradient descent. You would change WK, uh, such that it would become the current value plus uh, this update, which corresponds to the uh, opposite of the gradient times alpha, the learning rate. And now, if you if we go back to the Q update equation, uh, in the case of approximate Q learning, we I told you that we should do that, but this is nothing else than that same equation, where uh, y is now replaced by our current estimate of the uh, Q value for the next state, right? Uh, uh, no, sorry. Yeah, no, that was correct. Uh, so that's the target, that's the thing that we want to uh, 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 predict, which is given by the transition and our current knowledge of the Q value, right? And uh, the prediction uh, corresponds, so this weighted, uh, th this linear combination corresponds to or prediction uh, given by the model. So to, the, to our current estimate Q for SA. And so this thing is itself defined uh, in this way, right? Times FK, so times the feature associated to the coefficient K. Right? 
right? So this is quite simple uh, in the case of uh, a, a simple linear model to approximate the Q values. Of course, we could have made another choice and we could have said that, okay, instead of using a linear model to approximate the Q values, I will say, uh, use a neural network. Uh, and so if you do that, then you basically arrive to uh, an algorithm uh, which is known as uh, deep, uh, uh, deep Q learning or deep QN uh, for deep Q networks in which the Q tables now is uh, approximated uh, with a neural network. But otherwise the story is, 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 is the same, you would use Q-learning and make, uh, of course now, how you drive the uh, Q-update equation would be a bit different because uh, the way we make predictions is through a neural network. And so the expression for the predictions is a bit different, but, uh, other, but the principle would remain the same, uh, except that uh, the expression would be a, dip, a bit different. There are also other refinements uh, for this to actually work. Uh, uh, but uh, these things, you, if you're curious or if you want to learn, learn more about them, uh, this will actually be the, the, the topic of the reading assignments that I've, that I've just published uh, on the website, on the GitHub web page, in which uh, this DQN algorithm is, is presented and introduced to solve uh, video games. And uh, they are starting from Q-learning but plugging in instead a neural network and then showing that with some adjustment uh, to the algorithm, we can actually perform quite well uh, on these video games. All right, so now uh, there, there are a few questions in the chat and I will answer them and then we'll move on to, the, to some applications. So there is a third question here. So in slide 43, I don't understand the factor alpha times uh, NSA, does it represent the alpha of TD learning? Yes. So <clears throat> it's, it's not actually alpha times uh, some number, it's actually alpha defined as a function of the number of times you have experienced that particular transition, uh, start doing action A in S, right? So this is what I was showing also when I discussed this second bullet. So if you change alpha from a fixed parameter value to now a function that decreases as the number of times a state has been visited, then uh, the V value, or in this case, the Q value, would themselves convert to the correct value. And this is what they are doing. They are basically upgrading uh, the learning rate parameter now to a function, which depends on that number of times you've visited that particular Q state. Um, because if it's the case, alpha is a function that increases with the number of times the state has been visited and it does not ensure to me. Yeah, you would be right. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. All right, that's right, so we've seen that. Okay, so now I, I just want to finish today's lecture with a, a few applications. Um, there is so if you remember from two weeks ago, I've shown you uh, a, a video from some guy uh, training a recurrent neural network to try just to uh, mimic how he would themselves play, right? And, and, and if you remember, it was doing this quite well. Uh, that same guy actually published another video, which he calls MaRiQ, in which he uh, uh, trained a Q learning agent based on a neural network to solve the same task. And so I will not show you the video because it's quite long. Uh, I think it goes for 10 minutes. Welcome back, Seth Bling here. After four but uh, I invite you to watch it. The, it goes over the same materials more or less, but uh, in different ways and maybe less uh, with, with less mathematical groundings uh, and explain how he then uh, instantiates this Q learning algorithm to, to train his agent. I think it's quite interesting. And at the end, you see that the, the, the Q-learning agent is, is, is indeed capable of, 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 of playing uh, that game of Mario Kart, even though he just learned all of this by himself. Right? He's not trying to mimic or to replicate 
what uh, someone else is doing. It's just it's really learning by interacting with the environment how you should behave in this complicated environment. The second video which uh, I will show is one of these examples, uh, one of these games, these video games. So they are whole video games from the Atari game console, uh, which is used in that paper that I would like you to read. Uh, and one of these games is pinball. So uh, what you want to do is to control an agent to just be able to, to, uh, to control uh, some push button and then these two paddles in order to uh, maximize your score. So let's, let's see what the agent, the Q-learning agent would, uh, or the deep Q-network in this case, would manage to do. So at the beginning, what you see is that before training, the agent cannot even uh, manage to launch the ball. Uh, then after two hours of training, it manages to understand that it should uh, pull down and then up and then, and then release. But otherwise, for the two paddles, it's just making random moves. It's not working too badly. This is what I would do myself. And then from time to time, there are interesting transitions that happened. And in particular, those involving this bonus, these things there, uh, which uh, then leads to high, to high reward. And what you see is that after some time, the agent basically understand this, understand that it should try to go to these states uh, because they lead to high reward. And one, one, one way to do that is either to, to, to pull uh, this lever uh, with a high uh, amount of, of force, so that it will arrive there. And if, that, if the ball escapes from it, then it should be pulled back by properly controlling the nudge uh, that, you, that, you, that you make uh, with, the two, with the two paddles. And you see that, okay, it's not always easy, but it man the, the agent basically managed to pull the ball back uh, at this position. And this is something quite nice. This is something that the agent discovered by himself by just trying to, to, to maximize the reward and learning about the environment uh, as it is interacting with it. So of course you can play video games, but I don't think that's the most interesting applications. Uh, the most interesting application maybe for you engineers is what you can do with this kind of algorithms in, in reality. So, uh, 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 an important field of applications is, of course, robotics, uh, in which you have real robots that have to learn how to interact with the real world. And uh, using Q-learning or reinforcement learning in general, there are other algorithms that we have not talked about today, uh, is, is, of course, uh, 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 um, a very interesting and, and important application. Uh, so what you will see there is a bunch of robots, of robotic arms, and, and the, the, the task that they have to solve is to basically learn how to grasp objects of many different kinds, like uh, forks, knives, uh, cans, uh, bottles, uh, and other things like this. And they are equipped with a camera, which is giving them some percepts, that then they can use to figure out uh, if uh, they manage to, to grasp the object. They have also some reward signal. Um, so what you see is that uh, it starts with some state, which depends on the image. And the action that, you, you should that the robot should perform is basically how to open the, the, the gripper and, and where it should put the gripper before opening, uh, before trying to seize um, uh, the object. And you see that again, you can manage to find policy that would generalize quite well uh, to unseen objects. And this is precisely the purpose of this 
approximate Q learning algorithm that uh, I finished it with is because you, you really want to also be able to, this to, to apply the policy that you learn to unseen to new situations. And that could only happen if uh, you are using a function approximator of the Q tables, uh, which generalize well to uh, new, 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 uh, to new states, to unseen states. So in this case, of course, also the, 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 the just the state space would be gigantic because it would be the state of all possible images. Uh, that the, the robot could, uh, could could receive as percept, and so it is just uh, gigantically enormous. And so there is no way you would be able to uh, to learn uh, or to just even instantiate instantiate the corresponding Q table. But otherwise, it's again Q learning, but driven by a, a, a neural network. So of course there are many subtleties in how you should train these systems. Uh, what I've told you about during this lecture is only an introduction, but really the, the, the core of how these things are uh, implemented is really similar to what we've covered together uh, during the, the last three lectures on neural networks, on NDPs, and two days on, on reinforcement learning. Another, another example of application, uh, again in robotic, is, is uh, this video from a, a company uh, which is making uh, robots. Uh, I think this, wa this one is quite nice because the robots that they produce is, they are quite realistic uh, in some sense. Uh, and I think for you engineers, uh, they are really nice applications because they are merging uh, different disciplines from engineering, so uh, advanced mechanics, electronics uh, together with computer science and more specifically artificial intelligence uh, so i'll just uh, let you watch the video we've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that i know you haven't heard before the hand is man's most complex tool we use it to solve a wide range of everyday tasks. It can squeeze hard, it can grip sensitively, it can feel, it has incredible fine motoric skills. For us at Festo, it was therefore only natural to transfer this miracle of nature into technology. During the development of the pneumatic hand, I was responsible for the sensors and the software. For example, I developed the motherboard for the sensors, which I also selected and installed here, and can now get readouts with my own software. Our goal was to get as close as possible to the function of a human hand. To achieve this, we have opted for a pneumatic solution. In addition, we had to integrate the electronics and sensors, as well as the valves in a very confined space. In the current project, we want to equip the soft hand with artificial intelligence to rotate objects like this dodecahedron in your hand. The whole thing is implemented with reinforcement learning. A trial and error procedure is used in which successful actions are transferred to the controller as points of success. And the controller becomes better and better and learns to turn the object. If we were to learn the whole thing with a real hand, it would take us months. In order to do this in a simulation, we first have to create a digital twin. This involves identifying the physical properties of the soft hand and transferring 
transferring them to the simulation. And then we do that with 3D cameras, depth sensors and various algorithms. When we have the simulation on the digital twin, we can then do the whole thing 1,000 times. We can carry out massive parallel learning. This has the advantage that when one hand learns something, the knowledge is distributed to all other hands, and thus we can complete the task of several months in a very short time. In the factory of tomorrow, flexible and self-learning systems will shape the production processes. With the bionic soft hand, we have now taken a decisive step towards developing a gripper that is capable of learning. This offers incredible potential for the future. So if you're curious, really you should go to their website, they have really nice videos. So they are making this bionic hands, but they are making other crazy types of robots like uh, insects and some animal looking um, robots and, and many of them are driven but not all of them to be honest but some of them are driven by reinforcement learning algorithms all right so that's about it actually for this uh, for this for today's lecture so to summarize uh, i think we reach a, an important point in, in the course uh, we are now able to solve uh, not only uh, Markov decision process, which are known uh, using either policy or value iteration. But we are also now able uh, to solve unknown MDPs, and that's basically uh, reinforcement learning. And so, what we've seen is that today there are two families of methods that you could use to do that. The first one is the so called model based approach, in which basically what you try to do is to reduce the problem back to uh, unknown MDP. And the way you do that is by learning uh, approximation for the transition and the reward uh, models. And once you've done that, and you should do that properly, always thinking about uh, e exploration and exploitation. But if you if you do that correctly, uh, then you can plug back the uh, this uh, uh, this estimation to to obtain an empirical MDP. And then again, you can use the, the classical planning algorithms like value of policy iteration to derive the, uh, the optimal policy. On the other hand, if you want to go model free, if you don't want to uh, uh, build explicitly these transition and reward models, uh, then that's something you can do as, do as well. And for this, we have seen uh, one algorithm known as Q-learning. Uh, with several variants, like approximate Q-learning, which allows you to generalize to uh, unseen uh, uh, Q-states or unseen states, uh, <coughs> and which you can plug uh, together with simple models like linear models, this is what we have seen, uh, but of course, which you can also uh, plug together with neural networks, and that gives you uh, much more uh, capacity, much more power. And, and all the videos that I've shown you, they are all based on, on neural networks. All right, um, what else should I say? No, I think that's it. Okay, one last thing. Um, if you remember in the very first lecture, I, I started with this, my mission statement uh, for you. And I think now we've reached a point in the course where uh, uh, I'm beyond that. Uh, so if you remember the statement, what I said is that by the end of this course, you will have built or you will know how to build autonomous agents that efficiently make decisions in fully informed or partially observable or even adversarial settings. That's something now we, you can do uh, in the formalisms of uh, search algorithms, adversarial search or Markov decision processes. And your agents also will be able to draw inferences in uncertain environments. That's the whole thing uh, we covered with uh, poetic reasoning, uh, but also we would be able to do that under unknown environments. And this is what we have learned today uh, and also in the lecture about uh, learning. Uh, and you can mix all these things together in order to optimize actions uh, for arbitrary uh, reward structure, which is uh, what we covered uh, today in, uh, in this lecture about reinforcement learning. So I think now you are quite well covered if you are interested in, in learning more about artificial intelligence 
I think we reach a point in this course where you really have a good overview about the kind of things uh, you can do and how you could do it. Of course, there are many, many other things I've not talked about, uh, but uh, that's really the core, I, I would say, of artificial intelligence. And already, I, I suppose you could do a lot uh, with just this knowledge. We have two more lectures uh, next week and the week after, uh, but uh, more on the side lectures that are, uh, in my opinion, uh, less, much less important that, than what we have seen in, the, in this series of, of lectures from search algorithm to today's lectures. So next week we'll talk about communication, uh, which is basically trying to talk with, with your artificial intelligence, or at least trying to, to, to which will define us some kind of sequence to sequence problem. And then lastly, in two weeks from now, we'll talk about uh, artificial general intelligence, which is like a more speculative way about what should be, uh, 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 what would be uh, uh, some kind of true uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, all right, uh, so that's it for today. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to, to, to bring them in the chat again. Um,